Well, good evening, everyone, and very warm welcome to this um, special Commonwealth Heritage Forum talk. Um, we're delighted that Paul de Brodschik is here um, with us, and he's going to give his talk that is focusing on ornament for export, iron founders and visual cultures of display. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Paul. So Paul is a lecturer in history and theory of architecture at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL London, so that's University College London. He's the author of many books, and actually this talk is focused on one of his earlier books, um, Iron Ornament and Architecture in Victorian Britain, um, Routledge 2014. So have a look for that if you're interested um, in this topic, and we can maybe put a link in the chat as well in a little while. Um, he also um, is preparing for a new publication this autumn, Botanical Architecture, Plants, Buildings and Us. Um, so that will be published in the autumn. And he is a keen photographer and artist and built his own website, Stones of Manchester. I think we've got some people in the waiting room. Um, thanks, Meg. Um, so more details can be found, I think, on the link that was published on the um, talk information. So um, Paul is going to focus on how ornament iron founders developed practices of advertising their products for international markets in the 19th century. And um, this will focus on three important contexts um, illustrated trade catalogues, international exhibitions, and also iron buildings destined for export. And um, so we really, really look forward to hearing about all these aspects and some of the prominent iron founders like Walter McFarlane, which will feature in the talk. Um, and, and this talk's really thinking about how iron founders wanted to present themselves to the world and how their works ended up in the Commonwealth. So thank you very much, Paul, over to you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so just start with the title slide here. Um, but I, I sort of want to begin by showing you, um, oh, why is that not working? Oh, there we go. Um, so this is actually a photograph of um, the inside of what was the International Exhibition held in Glasgow in 1901. And what you can see in the middle there, a slightly hazy image, um, is the structure or exhibition stand created by iron founder Walter McFarlane uh, inside the machinery hall of the exhibition. Inside this structure, actually, are um, four cast iron sculptures representing industry, art, commerce, and science. You can't see them here, but you can see them in the uh, just about inside the fountain. So these are replicas of those which were created on the fountain um, in the middle of this image, which is also the Glasgow exhibition, the full grounds of it. And that fountain is actually still there in Glasgow in, um, ooh, I can't remember where it is, but it's in it's in one of the parks in Glasgow. And McFarlane's kind of um, signature kind of style of making cast iron really artistic and imbuing with this really strong mm -hmm. sense of and being material that you can make really beautiful. What you have in the um, stand though is almost like a concentrated representation of the company's products as a whole, their range of products, a three-dimensional catalogue. It was also a, a kind of elaborate sales pitch on behalf of the, uh, the McFarlane. Also at a kind of embodiment, they were chosen to represent Scotland here, so it's an embodiment of civic and national pride in that time. And then Glasgow, the beginning of the 20th century was one of the world's most important cities, one of the largest cities in the world in that period as well. Okay, so at the turn of the century, Walter McFarlane was a, a global leader in the manufacture of ornamental cast iron. This is an aerial view of his factory in uh, Postle Park. In, on the edge of Glasgow, was on the edge of Glasgow in, in that period. 14 acres of foundries, showrooms, warehouses, offices, and workshops. Not a single brick of this remains today. <laughs> if you were to go to Fossil Park today, and uh, it's, one, it's one of the less salubrious districts of Glasgow, <laughs> uh, you won't find a vestige, a single trace of this enormous complex of foundry buildings um, that existed at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, inside, so frontage, look at this for a for an industrial building. 
the frontage is in this extraordinary extravagant architectural style. Like we call it an empire style, um, which is completely appropriate for what um, McFarlane were trying to project really in their in their building here. But also the the ornamental possibilities of cast iron are everywhere on this building. That central dome entirely made from cast iron and glass. Even the chimneys have these little um, ornate cast iron caps on them. Um, so this really extraordinary kind of um, almost the building, the premises itself becoming also an advertisement for the company. In addition, inside would have been their showroom. The showroom is, is if you like, another kind of instance of bringing together all their products in this one place to create this sort of dazzling effect of ornamental kind of showmanship, if you like. And then their catalogues as well. So this was the sixth edition of their catalog published in 1882. Uh, you can see the showroom there on the left, but this ran to two volumes and had 6,000 illustrations in it, individual illustrations, all individual engravings of their product, um, beautifully reproduced um, by Historic Scotland um, in 2009. These catalogues are a wonderful uh, addition if you're interested in this, in this subject. Now, all of this showmanship, and it really is a, is a kind of um, a form of showmanship on the part of McFarlane, it demonstrates a kind of a really high level of confidence like this company had at the beginning of the 20th century. And this applied much more generally to manufacturers of cast iron, of which there were many others, most of which were based in and around Glasgow, um, competitors to McFarlane. McFarlane had good reason though, to feel like he was the leader in the field, really his, and that was mostly due to his international preeminence. More than any other of his rivals, McFarlane succeeded in exporting um, his products all over the world. So today, even though I don't have pictures of these because I haven't been to these places, his, his um, products still survive in India, South Africa, Australia, Brazil, Argentina, Malaysia, Singapore, and uh, Cyprus even as well. And these are the gates in um, the main park in Mendoza in Argentina, which still survive today. And even though many of these structures have been um, destroyed, the ones that do survive often have this really important place in the cities in which they were built, representing um, an example of a particular type of history that's really valued today. Um, okay, that's just my introduction. So what I want to do actually is to go right back to the beginnings of this um, notion of exporting buildings made of iron. Um, so we, we, we really need to go back to the Great Exhibition for this, to 18. 51. And, and this is just after McFarlane founded his company in 1850. So McFarlane didn't have really any, he was just beginning, just starting out, and his company wasn't represented in the Great Exhibition. Um, but this was a real sensation, this um, Great Exhibition, held in Joseph Paxton's Crystal Palace building, and it was seen to kind of epitomise and the sense of optimism in that period about what industrial production would do. It would just provide these undreamt of quantities of materials and wealth and also unify people as well. And the building was a kind of epitome of that too. Even though it's very utilitarian, there was a sense in which the sheer scale of it and the potential of cast iron and glass here provided the sort of utopian type of atmosphere. Now, one iron manufacturer was represented in the Great Exhibition, and that was the Colebrookdale Company in Shropshire, who were the most preeminent iron founders in that period. Um, they uh, provided this enormous um, cast and wrought iron sort of pavilion that really dominated the interior of the Crystal Palace, and also uh, these gates which were quite important in the, in the opening ceremony when Queen Victoria opened the Crystal Palace, but it remained quite near to where the Crystal Palace was, um, just at the entrance to Kensington Gardens, these ornate cast iron gates made by the Colbert Company. 
Now, the Great Exhibition is also important in demonstrating the potential export market for iron structures. Now, I don't have, I wasn't able to find any images of the buildings that were on show. So uh, there were 50 model buildings inside the Crystal Palace, all of which were intended to be exported to British, um, Britain's expanding colonies at the time. Uh, some of these were iron, but some also were timber. So the exporting of buildings begins with timber, um, mm -hmm. which is obvious, obviously enough, it's a much easier material to assemble and disassemble. Um, and an early example is, an, is a hospital sent to a penal colony in Australia in 1790. Now, but as cast and wrought iron began to be used more widely in industrial buildings and for structures like bridges and mills, timber gets substituted for iron um, because iron's stronger, it tends to be, it's much more resistant to fire. And in a way, it's more versatile as a structural material than timber is as well, more hard wearing. So by the mid 19th century, by the time of the Crystal Palace, the design and manufacture of prefabricated iron buildings had be already become a commercial enterprise. And there were specialist founders who did this kind of work. This is a page from the catalogue of Charles D. Young, who was a, 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 I think a London based iron founder who specialised in buildings for export. It was part of celebrating Britain's in empire and the, the, the imperial achievement. And they were also about domesticating this idea of these, these far off lands, right? So these buildings were supposed to look a little bit like, you know, domestic buildings you would find in England, apart, obviously, apart from the ironwork <laughs> that's used. And the one at the bottom there, I think, looks a li a li not quite so inviting uh, as a sort of railway shed type structure with a corrugated iron roof. But they were supposed to appeal to a certain kind of sense of, you know, being at home in a, in a foreign country, um, even as they were really modern as well in terms of the construction materials. The majority, as you can see in this image, were very simple utilitarian structures. Um, and one of the first important ones, and again, don't have an image of this, um, it's important to kind of introduce this, was a three-storey corn mill designed by William Fairburn, who's an engineer based in Manchester, that was intended for export to Turkey in 1840. Very utilitarian in appearance. And what's really interesting about this and what becomes a normal thing to do is to pre-erect them in Britain uh, to, to test out whether the uh, assembly and disassembly works, uh, rather like a sort of Ikea building, if you like, um, but also to show them off, to show them off to the public as a sort of example of cutting edge technologies that Britain and British engineers and manufacturers are pioneering. So it's a bit of showmanship as well in terms of um, what these buildings do before they get taken and exported to their intended locations, and sometimes they don't get this in. Um, an early example of one that we do have an image of is this building. So this was um, 1843, Liverpool iron founder William Laycock built, designed and built what was called an iron palace for King Ayambo in West Africa, which is now um, in, in what is now Nigeria. So again, like the uh, the corn mill, this was um, put up and open for public viewing in Liverpool before being exported. It gave it wide coverage. So it got to the builder. The builder is the leading, most prestigious uh, architectural publication in Britain at the time. And any building that gets in there gets is, is deemed as to be as significant. So it needs to be reported nationally. Uh, but you can see What's interesting about this is it's a very plain structure. It's um, architecturally speaking, quite reminiscent of like a domestic villa, but also at the same time, really modern in, in its appearance. 
you can see behind the veranda. So there's a cast iron columns all around the outside to support the veranda, which would have been a kind of it's a functional element of the building. But the building behind is just cast iron plates. So the building is essentially a, 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 a tin, a, an iron house with these sort of slightly decorative embellishments, but otherwise quite a plain structure, not what you would call a palace by any means, right? Um, but the builder was quite impressed by it, and particularly the interior, which unfortunately we don't have any images of. So the builder describes it as uh, the, the second floor room, really, as a grand state room forming a royal audience chamber, featuring French wallpaper, gilded cornices, papier-mâché, pictures, glass chandeliers, mirrors, and other ornate furnishings. Um, interestingly, though, the iron was still exposed in the interior. There was no sort of sense in which you should cover up the ironwork. It was too modern, too brash as a material, too functional. Now, it was supposed to go to the fortified ethic settlement of Iboku Atapka, which at that time, by the British colonists, was known as Old Calabar. The building was sent to its location. It was built six feet clear of the ground, supported on posts from mangrove trees, uh, leaving space for storage and sleeping underneath. We don't have a detailed account of its uh, use in West Africa, uh, but it seems to have emerged out, out of King Ayamba's own personal kind of tastes and requirements. He wanted to be seen as a modernizing presence in um, West Africa. He was the fifth of a long succession of rulers of the ethnic people. He ruled from 1834 to 1836. And this coincided with the final suppression of slavery in West Africa, its, its replacement with plantations of palm oil and palm kernel, and also a little bit later, the arrival of Christian missionaries as well. We don't know why he wanted an iron building, but I think he was probably attracted by its modernity and sense of progressiveness as well. What's in, what, is, what we do know is that the building didn't last very long. So Ayamba died in 1846 um, and his palace was abandoned. It was still there in 1854, according to one source, but by four years later, it had fallen. It had it, it been um, fallen into ruin. And um, as far as I know, not a vestige of it remains today. Now this idea that you could build palaces from really utilitarian materials like cast iron was relatively short lived, right? And it didn't really re emerge again until what we now call the sort of modernist period of the early 20th century. And this was really on account of one particular building that people really didn't like uh, the so called Brompton boilers, which were built in 1856 as temporary buildings for the South Kensington Museum. So the South Kensington Museum would eventually in the 1880s become the magnificent natural history museum, which uh, in, is, is a very, very important architectural site in London today. But for many years, it was in temporary accommodation and uh, the Brompton boilers were one of these manifestations of the building. Manufactured by Charles Young, who we saw earlier was doing quite utilitarian buildings for export. It was wide, get, got widespread criticism for its ugly utilitarian appearance. Um, plain and ungainly, it was called by the builder. And it, what, it, what it did was to really change manufacturers' approach to how they, um, how they went about producing buildings made out of cast iron and it, towards a much more ornamental approach. So it was largely kind of this sort of a, a change in taste, but also a change in opinion, critical opinion, that made iron founders change what they were doing in the 1850s. There were also developments abroad as well. Um, really important figure in, in the US is James Bogardus. James Bogardus was um, um, a manufacturer who 
patented this particular way of using cast iron to create entire buildings. So you just see that on the bottom uh, right there, a building entirely made out of cast iron that he constructed in, in New York. And here's one that's still there today in, in Canal Street in Manhattan. A really fab, I, I mean, I think this is a fabulous, this is 1860s, this building, and it looks fabulously modern uh, even today. Uh, the whole facade there, the whole building is basically assembled from prefabricated cast iron um, elements. Um, okay, in the UK, in Britain, one of the first buildings that, that indicated this change in approach was a, a bathing kiosk uh, designed for the Viceroy of Egypt uh, and designed by the, the celebrated railway engineer Robert Stevenson. Right? You wouldn't expect to produce a building so ornate as this one. So probably the manufacturer did most of this work. So Henry Grissel was a London manufacturer and he put this structure up on the Isle of Dogs in the summer of 1858 for public viewing before it was um, exported. Uh, now this initiated some a little bit of a craze for iron buildings in Egypt in the 1860s. And one that's still there is this building, not quite in such magnificent shape now as it, as it was when it was pictured here. Um, this is the, uh, um, oh, what is it? The Gezira Palace in, in Cairo, um, built in 1864 by German architects. Now a Marriott Hotel, I believe, in, in Cairo. I've never been to Cairo, so I can't tell you what, what it's like now. A fantastic kind of use of cast iron here as well. It's been argued by architecture historians like uh, Mark Pinson that these sorts of ornate cast iron buildings provided Egyptian rulers with technology, up-to-date technology, but also a kind of exotic image, an oriental image of what their rule was doing. So it was on the one hand, both modern, but also this sort of sense of symbolic meaning as well was very important as well, which is very typical of Victorian buildings as a whole. And I think what makes them so, so fascinating really. So the building was based on a Greek cross plan and had this lofty central dome and these other domes as well four smaller domes on either side. And the whole thing's on supported on cast iron columns that are sunk into the river. So this would have been located on the banks of the River Nile. We are not sure about the exact intended location, um, but it was in on the Isle of Dogs for over a year and a half. So it gained a lot of attention from the press, particularly publications like The Builder. And it sort of acted as an advertisement, rather like McFarlane's um, exhibition stand, a sort of advertisement for the iron founder and what they could do, what they could achieve with cast iron, and particularly in an ornamental way. So this very fabulous sort of decoration as well. And it was widely praised at the time. So um, a correspondent for the Illustrated London News went to see it on the Isle of Dogs. And I guess the Isle of Dogs cannot be imagined as a more different place than the banks of the River Nile in Egypt, <laughs> even today. Um, and the correspondent said, if we can see the brilliancy of an Eastern sun and the clearness of an Eastern atmosphere, we may imagine, we may imagine the effect of this kiosk glittering with its reflection in the waters of the most classical river in the world. Now, it appears that the building did reach Egypt, but not its intended destination on the banks of the Nile. Robert Stevenson died in 1859, and also its patron, Said Pasha, who commissioned the building, died in 1863. And both of these things seem to have scuppered the final stages of the project. It was considered to be reused as a railway station, but then it was boxed up and remained in crates in Alexandria for many years. And like those other two buildings, um, we don't know what happened to it. So this is really an interesting sort of trail of buildings that we see here that probably, I mean, I would say they might actually exist somewhere um, that some uh, intrepid historical sleuth 
needs to go and uh, <laughs> look at yeah. and try and find out where these buildings are or where parts of them might be. So in the autumn of 1866, another, yet another highly ornamental cast iron building was, it was put up and displayed in London at this time in South Kensington. Uh, again, this failed to reach its destination, which was Bombay in um, British controlled India at that time. We think this one was a victim of the financial crisis, which hit India particularly hard in 1866. Now this building is fascinating because it's the result of a collaboration between an engineer and an architect. The engineer is Roland Mason Ordish. The architect is Owen Jones. Um, and it was made by Andrew Handyside. They're an iron founder that were based in, in Derby. Consisted of this very open cast iron structure on a grid of 10 foot columns uh, joined by these rather fabulous sort of oriental style arches and this sort of lattice roof composed of dozens of arabesque panels, better appreciated in the interior, the interior view showing the extraordinary roof, entirely cast iron. Um, really interesting, like this idea of an all encompassing structural approach that is nevertheless highly ornamental as well. The bits that join these together, so cast iron has to be joined together. You can't make this in one piece, if you like. But all the bolts that join it together are very skillfully hidden by the iron founders in order to suggest that the whole structure is basically uh, almost as if it's been carved, right? That's what the intention is to look like naturally, naturally carved by the machine produced. Um, it shows how much iron founders had learned really in the 20 years since these very early utilitarian structures. Um, also, it was intended to reflect something of its context, where it was supposed to go, this very imagined exotic locale um, in uh, subtropical India, right, that actually was reflected in the style that was being adopted. Also, some, to some extent, reflects the Islamic kind of influence in Mughal architecture. Uh, in the period before the British rule. Um, okay, it's a relatively early example of architects and engineer collaboration. And I, I just want to say a little bit more about Owen Jones because he's, he's such an interesting and often quite forgotten figure in Victorian architecture, even though he, he did some incre incredible things. So he came to fame, first of all, with his color scheme or the interior of the Crystal Palace. So many people were thought the Crystal Palace was much too stark in its appearance, these cast iron columns and glass, suggesting nothing of traditional kind of architectural values, which were mainly based on ornament. And Jones's solution was really interesting that he just did it through painting the, the iron. So he painted the iron in primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, and white as well. So that when seen from a distance, the colours seem to merge into each other and create this kind of atmospheric haze, which Jones thought was a really interesting way of dealing with cast iron and making it ornamental, but certainly not in any kind of traditional conventional sense of what ornament means. He also designed some really unusual buildings in London in the 1850s. So this was the Crystal Palace Bazaar, um, which was in central London and later on he designed a shop, an Osler's shop, also in, in central London. In the Crystal Palace Bazaar, the um, what we have is a kind of cast iron structure here with wrought iron ribs. Everything is sort of filled in with these very sort of Islamic style ornamentation that is basically stained glass. So he's using plaster to support the stained glass, um, but to create this incredibly strong kind of atmospheric effect inside this sort of, basically is a shopping arcade uh, really, but this sort of fabulous sort of sense of the use of color and atmosphere in combination with very modern progressive materials. A similar thing is going on in this shop as well. Similar use of stained glass. This time he's, he's created this sort of 
stepped vault this it's a, it's called a trilobe vault so in three stages using iron and glass in combination um, to create this rather fantastical effect vaguely islamic i think and it's, jones was really interested in islamic buildings he was key in the sort of um rediscovery of the alhambra in granada in southern spain and the celebration of um islamic ornament um it more generally some of you, you might have probably seen jones is best known for this work the publication the grammar of ornament published in 1856 uh, where he kind of categorizes all the ornament of the world into one book and gives kinds of advice to designers on how to use it how to adapt it to modern conditions and he saw islamic ornament in particular as particularly suitable for cast iron and the reason for this is because it's very flat flat geometric surfaces work really well when they're cast so casting is very it's very difficult to get three-dimensional effects in casting just because the nature of the process is uh, warrants quite flat result. So Jones was very, he understood a lot of these processes in a way that many other architects didn't, but he used kind of historical examples as a way of sort of infusing his own designs, both with a sense of history, but also, you know, cutting edge modernity as well at his own time. So coming back, coming back to the kiosk, So it was, a, it was a smoking kiosk. It was procured through the agency of R.W. Crawford, who was a Bombay-based London merchant and chairman of the East Indian Railway Company. And George Trollope and Sons, who were a firm of interior designers based in uh, London. And as I said, it was um, put up in Kensington in the summer of 1866 and subsequently um, failed to reach Bombay because of the financial crisis. So, but it remained in London for over three years. So it was seen as sort of like an exotic curio, rather like a gigantic sort of garden pavilion when it was in London uh, and celebrated really as showing the real possibilities of a, a, a ornamental, decorative, aesthetic approach to cast iron building, uh, which was actually pretty influential, I think, on iron founders like McFarlane in the decades to come. This particular structure was, was built by Andrew Handyside, the Dar a Derby-based iron founder. And at that time, Handyside was really the world leader in buildings for export, for the export market. There was a, a series of publications called Works in Iron, written by Ewing Matheson, who was an employee at Handy Sides, that gave details of all of their projects. And this is almost the only place you can find um, their works now, uh, illustrations of their works, because many of them have disappeared. So this is an example of a, a cast iron column capital that Handy Side were producing in this period. And you can see the extraordinary sense of this is all cast iron. So this is three dimensional, but this is achieved by bolting together probably a dozen or so separate castings and then concealing the joints so it looks like it's been carved. A really extraordinary example. And you can see many of these sorts of capitals on railway stations now, where there's a lot of experimentation, Victorian railway stations, in using cast iron in this way. And they exported many buildings. This is the Baikula or Baisula Club in Bombay parts of which are cast iron. This is the best image I could get of it, uh, unfortunately. A market hall in Madrid. Don't I don't know whether that's still there. That is in Works in Iron, so that's in Handy Size publication. And Gasworks. Right? This, is, this is a Gasworks in Nicaragua in Brazil. Look at the level of ornamentation on these structures for an incredibly utilitarian uh, purpose. Again, not sure whether that's still, that was built in 1869. In the 1870s, we have a decline in the number of buildings exported, partly because imperial colonies started to produce their own iron. So these technologies were also exported. So they got 
good enough at it to do their own work, which clearly result is a much cheaper way of creating cast iron buildings. But specialist founders like McFarlane continue to do really well out of the international market and still really flourish as well because their expertise was kind of um, learned over many decades. Uh, okay, so McFarlane in the late 19th century was targeting, increasingly targeting his products at overseas traders. And he published one edition of his uh, catalogs, at least one in Spanish for the South American market. And it's interesting that many iron buildings still survive in South America. This, these are the entrance gates to the main park in the city of Mendoza in Argentina, which were made by uh, McFarlane at the very end of the 19th century. Um, and also this building, which I, I would, would love to see this building. <laughs> I've never actually been to India. This is the Durbar Hall in Mysore or Mysore in India, 1897. Cast iron, I mean, it's incredible, isn't it, that, that one could create this kind of effect in cast iron. Or incredible to think that one would even try it. <laughs> uh, so I don't know this building, but it, it's got that sense of it's, it's been really well looked after and it would be a fascinating one to visit. And you can see again the stained glass here, which I think is taking, taking these principles from a much earlier period from Owen Jones and combining them with the use of cast iron uh, in a way that Jones, I think, would have really appreciated. But Farlam was increasingly doing that much later on in the 19th century is incorporating stained glass into his iron structures as well. Um, Okay, so in the later catalogues, you see McFarlane, in a sense, suggesting um, in this image. I, I'm wondering if Ali Davy showed this when she did her talk as well, of almost like McFarlane transforming the world through his the use of ornamental cast iron. So in this image, you can see, <clears throat> you know, buildings like uh, um, I mean, buildings started up with ornamental iron work. You can see water fountains, lamps, railings. In the middle there is a, is a gentleman's urinal. And these are, the urinals are the real fabulous structures, which um, some of which are incredible level of ornamentation. So it's such a structure that you would not expect. But it's almost as if McFarlane's suggesting that his products, if used in a, a really interesting way, could actually transform almost everything in, in the city. Um, Again, this is advertising, but I think it's very interesting, the suggestion that this material is a kind of universal material that could create this very interesting unity of ornaments in cities uh, that was often lacking in 19th century architecture. Um, so right at the end of the 19th century, McFarlane was still the leading iron manufacturer, still very well known and celebrated by uh, the British press as well. Now, just to finish, um, I just want to say something. I, I think what's so interesting about cast iron buildings in the 19th century is how they seem to follow the very opposite course of what we'd now call modernism in architecture. So the sort of turn towards a much more functional approach to building, which is pretty much still with us today. So the modernist argument is that in the 19th century and in the early 20th century, architects and engineers gradually removed surplus decoration from their buildings and honed things to a sort of functionalist style that comes to dominate most kinds of buildings from the 1920s onwards. And again, it's impossible to imagine someone designing a, a steel frame building like that cast iron kiosk that Jones, Owen Jones designed today, right? It'd just be unthinkable that a, that a steel manufacturer would do that. Uh, I didn't even, even know if it's possible to do that with steel. Um, but in the Victorian period, things were co completely different because Victorians generally made a very clear distinction between what they would call mere building, mere construction, and architecture. 
the latter architecture is an art that is kind of in the art that kind of embellishes building and it's usually done as a way of going beyond mere utility and in, including ornament and i think this image by mcfarlane is really interesting in, in the, exactly what it shows it shows a kind of embellishment of the environment that would be much poorer and plainer without these decorative embellishments. What's interesting about McFarland is this, this kind of material would be quite cheap in this period because it was mechanically um, manufactured. Um, but there was a problem with iron from the very beginning. Another image of the Crystal Palace, and this one I think shows how plain it was, how massive and plain the building was in its appearance. Most people didn't think the Crystal Palace was architecture. Even someone like Owen Jones, who's very progressive, would have regarded not seeing this as a work of architecture, more a work of construction. And in a sense, adding ornament to iron is about investing this material with more than mere utility. It's not really about adding decoration on top of you know, the, the, the structural aesthetics of iron, but actually trying to find a way of uniting structure and decoration in one in one go, if you like. And casting does that sort of, even though you have joints and bolts, which you would have with any material. The ornament isn't can't be really separated from the structure in a meaningful way. What happens in the 20th century, of course, is both a change of taste, but also I think particularly in relation to iron manufacturers, the advent of the war. So the First World War in particular, most British iron manufacturers in the First World War were forced to abandon their ornamental buildings because everything was made for munitions <laughs> and you don't have ornamental munitions. <laughs> So they, they they were forced to abandon this approach for, for four years and they never really recovered after that. And I just sort of show you the catalogue, as it is a rather poignant catalogue of McFarlane from 18, 1937, very plain. And McFarlane were almost on their way out here really by 1937. And the Second World War totally killed any revival of ornament in, um, in cast iron architecture after the Second World War. Um, so we have a, a, a quite dramatic ending, I think, in the 20th century. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is that I find interesting about iron buildings, particularly ornamental iron buildings, and something that really motivated my own research and interest in this subject. It's almost like an alternative pathway that could emerge with materials in architecture where um you know this idea of like actually everything being utilitarian and functional doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have um aesthetic can take aesthetic pleasure in in things and it's something which i think the 19th century approach to iron work and particularly these these buildings for export really demonstrates um very powerfully and that's probably all I've got to say. <laughs> no, stop. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul. That's really fascinating. And um, we've got a little bit of time for questions. Does anyone have a, a question they'd like to ask, Paul? <laughs> I'll give you a moment to think. I was just interested, you sorry if if you said it, I apologize, I might have missed it. But what happened to the um the kiosk building you said it was a couple of years in south kensington what what happened to it after that um i actually don't know okay. i don't know so um, in, in so many cases these buildings they, they, their fate is unknown you know my guess that it would have been possibly the iron would have been melted down okay so in some cases you know the bits the the individual components of the building turn up in other places and you often see this in um, garden furniture and railings, that sometimes you get bits of old ironwork turning up in new configurations. And sometimes bits and pieces appear in salvage yards. Um, but it's un I think it's very unlikely that it was survived. Um, 
but this is where more work needs to be done you know it, it kind of like slightly i slightly feel like it would be quite fun to to just yeah. travel the world <laughs> looking for these structures <laughs> um you know, it'd be, be, be great, great sort of detective work, I think. Um, because I think there are probably many more than, than we think, but probably it reconfigured in some way into other into other structures. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions they'd like to ask? So I, I've just got one other question while everyone is thinking. Um, so you talked about the sort of different ways in which, you know, you know, the, these um, structures were kind of advertised for international markets, you know, the, the catalogues, the international exhibitions, and then actually making the buildings. Which, which do you think was the most successful in terms of sort of international? Um, I think probably the catalogues. I think... You know, uh, trade catalogues are something which um, in manufacturers like McFarlane particularly were really, really pioneering in terms of the amount of money they invested and time and money they invested into making these things because they were often sent free of charge to, um, to you know, customers as well. And also, you know, translating them into into different languages as well shows this kind of seriousness they took this sort of you know the potential of the export export market and the fact they were doing this quite late you know the first decades of the 20th century as well i think shows a level of confidence um but it's sort of you know it does sort of all it comes to this very abrupt halt um after the first world war um and often i think you know when you're the, the most confident time you're about to go <laughs> um so it's it's interesting but i think the catalogs to me are the most extraordinary things that they've left because even though is you don't see a huge number of their structures you know the catalog suggests that they were producing incredible amounts of this stuff mm. and, and where the cat are the catalogs kind of existing in collections then in, in uh, yeah it means uh, historic scotland have a really good um range of catalogues so do the vna in london um but also whether or not you can still get the historic scotland um the reproduction of mcfarlane catalog because they are really fabulous um you know they're basically a facsimile of the sixth edition in two volumes and i i, I got them for six pounds you know they're really cheap <laughs> but i think they might have only released a few so they might be quite expensive now um but they are really fabulous um, and definitely worth buying if you're interested in, in the subject. Brilliant. And in terms of who, who bought, was that generally the Commonwealth countries? Did it kind of it link to the Commonwealth, do you think, or, or was it broader than that? Well, I think it definitely linked to uh, the empire, whether you would call that the informal or the formal empire, that you know there would be already be so you know say iron is used much more readily for other things like railways bridges all, all sorts of utilitarian things but once contracts are in place and they're usually british manufacturers who get those contracts then it becomes possible for ornamental founders to also get get in in with the kind of in in the market you like as a sort of secondary kind of market for, for, for structures. Um, so there's something really interesting about the links there between uh, more utilitarian work being done, particularly railways, I think, and these more ornamental structures as well. Mm. I mean, I personally, you know, the work I was doing was, was really focused on Britain. So this work is just a very small part of the research I did. And some of it is also borrowed from another scholar Jonathan Clark who did some who's, who's done more research on on these particular buildings but there are there are people doing research on the export market so uh, Lucia Juarez is a Argentinian um, historian who's done work on the 
McFarland's work in Argentina as part of her PhD. So it it requires that. I think it requires these sort of detailed studies to be done in particular countries and the legacy of the work. You, I'm sorry, so Victoria, who is actually on this call, Victoria and I um, recently went to Freetown in Sierra Leone as part of a, a project mm. for, um, for the Commonwealth Heritage Forum. And we saw some really beautiful uh, ironwork mm -hmm. on a building in Freetown. If you were to try and work out, how would you begin to work out which um company foundry that came from is that are you relying on um paperwork as in you know obviously like written sort of records that may still exist or even like you were saying the catalogs or is there a way of telling from the That's iron good, work itself it's a good question i mean many iron founders stamp their name into the ironwork okay okay so, so you know quite a lot of the identification is easy because the name is in the name. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that always helps. But <laughs> sometimes, you know, that's not always the case. Yeah, okay. Sometimes it's so, the ironwork's so old that that's faded, so you can't really tell. I see, and, and okay. What I did generally was a mixture of that and cross-identification using catalogues. So if, yeah, you, see, okay. if you see a um, particular thing in a catalogue, a bracket or a railing, you can usually tell you start to see oh that's McFarlane but this is a bit complicated because they used to steal each other's designs right the companies did steal McFarlane's but they, McFarlane were actually very very good on litigation so they, <laughs> they, they pounced on people that tried to steal their yeah designs. okay so <laughs> you start to recognize I mean paperwork there's hardly any paperwork yeah most time founders did not leave paper records very very frustrating when I was doing my research, that it's hardly anything. Right, I see. You in Scotland, but it's even then they're not very organised. Yeah, you know, the archives yeah. are not very organised. Okay, okay, thank you. And did they sort of patent their designs then, or? Yeah, they did. They did, yeah. but it's hard because you know a cast of a design is um, it's very easy to reproduce it. And just tweak it slightly so it does it, it do you know what i mean it, you know even a slight tweak in the design means that you can probably get away with it um but also you can show stuff in your catalogs that you don't actually make so mm -hmm. i think this is something that that founders did is they look like they're doing fabulous work i don't think mcfarland i think they genuinely saw the size of their premise i think they generally had every single casting on mm -hmm. their premises <laughs> but some manufacturers were sort of lying about what they could actually produce in their catalogues um mm. but they were they were it was it's very interesting you know the rivalries between them um because most of them were scottish right and, and all based within like quite a small area around glasgow mm. um all competing for the same market really um mm. brilliant well thank you so much paul i don't isn't it does anybody that's still on the call has any questions you've all been very quiet today <laughs> um do do let us know um but yeah thank you so much um for preparing that for us and and um, i'm sure there'll be lots of people watching their recordings as well on catch up which is coming ever more popular um our next talk is on the 5th of june so we're carrying on this um theme of, of cast iron in the commonwealth and that's focusing on cast iron in the in south africa so yeah, do tune in for that one as well. And yeah, Paul, we wish you all the best with your publication of your book thank that's you. coming up. And um, thanks yeah, very thank much. You. And thank it was you. very enjoyable presenting this material again, and it's really great to revisit it. So thank you for the invitation. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. All right. All right. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank nice you. Bye.